get started. Thank you all for being here. Good morning. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to the third annual New England Graduate Student Water Symposium here at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. I'm Hassan Khan, uh, a PhD candidate here in the EWRE program. I'm one of the uh, organizing co chairs along with Catherine Schleff, uh, Jill Mullen, and Joanne Rodriguez, and Travis Drury. Um, so if you see any one of us around roaming around the conference, if you have any questions, comments, suggestions, please feel free to approach us and uh, we'll be happy to help you however we can. Um, this event, this whole symposium next year is, is being uh, um, put together by the EWRE program in conjunction with the WRRC from the USGS, affiliated with the USGS. Um, we'd also like to say a thanks, uh, word of thanks to our sponsors um, who allow us to uh, all this uh, symposium in the way that we do, and without whose support we would not be able to do so. Um, Tyne Bond, uh, Aquarian Water Company, Hazen and Sawyer, Wright Pierce, Carollo Waters, and Clean Membranes, all of them uh, supported, have been continuously supporting us throughout um, our work over the past few years. So we're really excited to uh, have some terrific water-related presentations and posters uh, for the next two days. Um, been going through the technical sessions and trying to arrange all the talks um, and the presentation. I've been really excited by the presentations that uh, we have to look forward to. We have close to over close to 200 registered attendees um, and presenters from over 30 different uh, schools across the northeastern U.S. and Canada. We have people um, as far away from uh, uh, British Columbia coming in attending, so that's uh, very encouraging and uh, exciting. Um, I just have a few important announcements before we get to our main event um, for this session. Um, so there's some housekeeping things. For those presenting posters, the poster boards have been set up in the Dennis Student Center in Marcus Hall, where you might have uh, registered today um, or yesterday. So you should be able to set up your posters at any point during the day before the session starts at 3.30. Um, we are also organizing a panel session um, featuring um, uh, this afternoon titled Intersections Between Water and Industry. Um, and this session is really intended to provide uh, students with an uh, overview and insight into uh, the careers and people interested in non-academic careers. And we have a very diverse group of members including um, leading figures from the public and the private sector along with recent graduates in the consulting water related fields. Um, so included in your registration folder is a question ticket for this session. And so if you have a question that you'd like to have asked um, the panel members, um, please write it down and put it in the box at registration. Um, and if you can do that before lunch, um, we would be really grateful. Um, in addition, you also have voting tickets for best oral and best uh, poster presentations. Um, we will be giving out um, some really cool award that we picked out uh, tomorrow in our closing ceremony. Um, so please do uh, um, uh, turn in your tickets for the best poster presentations and best oral presentations. Um, we also want to uh, encourage you to help generate some social media buzz for this event. Um, we'll be giving us away a special prize for a tweet containing the hashtag NextViz. Um, we'll be chosen at random and we'll be doing that at the closing ceremony tomorrow. So get your phones out and if you had any excuse to use Twitter, this is it. Um, finally, we'll be taking a group picture with all the conference attendees at 11.30 before we head out to lunch. So that is immediately after the first technical session. That will be done um, outside on the stairs, uh, outside Marcus Hall, um, where the big banner conferences, so please uh, try and get there at 11.30 as soon as your session ends, we can take a group photo and all of us can head out to lunch, for which you all have lunch tickets in your registration packets, and so uh, please take them along with you when we go to the dining commons for lunch. Um, that's all the housekeeping announcements from my end. I'll just invite uh, Dr. Rekha, Dr. David Rekha, the EWI program coordinator, to say a few words. Sure, thanks, Sana. On, on behalf of the University of Massachusetts, I want to once again welcome you all here. Uh, this is, as, as Sana said, this is the third annual New England Graduate Student Water Symposium, and it was originally conceived as a way of getting a building community among the, the graduate students and 
advanced undergraduates, um, maybe some postdocs. In the Northeast U.S., oops, sorry, the Northeast U.S. region and, and uh, nearby Canada. Um, and we have a tremendous co concentration of high quality universities in this area. And it seemed like this was a logical thing uh, to do, to build community among, among all of you who are uh, the future leaders in the water area. Um, and so uh, we started three years ago, and it was really done by the students, not by the faculty. And so none of us uh, among the faculty here really had uh, much to do. And so all the credit uh, goes to the student organizers. And so I'd like to especially well uh, acknowledge, and, and Hassan has mentioned, uh, the, the, the co-chairs, Hassan and Julie and Joanne and Catherine, and also the work of, of Paula Reese in the Water Resources Research Center and, and Travis as well. Um, I think this has been a, a, a great event. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, and uh, I also want to once again uh, thank the sponsors because we, the students have worked hard to keep the costs down, as you probably noticed. And uh, it's, it's no accident, but the sponsors have helped tremendously. Uh, so once again, please, if you see the sponsors, thank them. Uh, they, many of them, most of them represent uh, uh, consulting firms. Uh, they are here, and uh, they may even be hiring. So uh, it's especially a good idea to, to um, introduce yourself uh, to the sponsors. Um, and so once again, I, I just want to thank you for coming. I want to encourage you all to tweet, and uh, there will be a competition, and I think maybe there's an over-60s competition, too. <laughs> uh, so the bar's pretty low there. So once again, I'll, I'll turn the microphone back over to the side to introduce the speaker. So, uh, thank you, Dr. Reco. I'm um, honored to introduce to all of you today Dr. Robert Hirsch, um, our keynote speaker for today. He really is in no need of an introduction, but I'll just quickly run through some key highlights from his career. Um, he earned a uh, BA in Geology from Earlham College and MS in Geology from the University of Washington and a PhD from John, John Hopkins at, uh, in the Department of Geography and Environmental Engineering. He currently serves as research hydrologist at the USGS where um, he also served as the chief hydrologist from uh, 1994 to 2008. He has been instrumental in developing interagency priorities for water science and technology and has had a leading role in the development of several major USGS programs, including the National Water Quality Assessment Program, the National Stream Flow Information Program, um, and the National Water Information Systems Web. His numerous honors and awards include the 2006 American Water Resources, uh, Water Resources Association's William C. Ackerman Medal for Excellence in Water Management, to go along with the rank of meritorious senior executive conferred to him twice by the President of the United States. Um, Dr. Hirsch is co-author of the textbook Statistical Methods in Water Resources and a recipient of the USGS Eugene M. Shoemaker Award for Lifetime Achievement in Communications. He's also a fellow of the American, Association's, American Association for the Advancement of Science. In addition to all of that, he's also an avid drawer uh, and enjoys rowing and has promised us that there is a photo during the presentation of a uh, bridge that he rode under on the Potomac. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, please join me in welcoming Dr. Robert Kirsch for this. All right, thank you for that introduction. It's a pleasure to be here and to see uh, uh, the, the next generation of, of water resources scientists and engineers and planners, etc. So uh, I want to leave you with some philosophy about how I see the, uh, uh, I'm just going to jot down time so I don't screw up here and, and go over my limit. Uh, uh, the next generation of scientists, engineers, planners, etc. Uh, and uh, want to give you a, some of my perspective gained over my 40 year uh, career in the, in the uh, study of hydrology and water management. Um, I want to start in a very historical kind of way and talk about uh, the origins of, of collecting data about water resources. 
in the United States and really in a sense worldwide really kind of can retrace back to John Wesley Powell, who was the second director of the U.S. Geological Survey. And he was interested in the question of how to develop the resources of the United States, uh, particularly irrigation in the West, but also industry and municipalities in the East. And he said, we can't even begin to plan for that and do that unless we have data on the flow of our rivers. And he began the USGS stream gauging program in 1888. Um, and, and that data has accumulated over time. Um, and we now have about 8,000 stream gauges nationwide that measure the flow of rivers on a daily basis. Um, the, the progression of the, of the thinking and the development uh, in, of, of water resources uh, planning and management, um, in a sense, in my mind, kind of culminated in something called the Harvard Water Program, which existed in the 1950s and 60s, which was the first attempt to really pull together uh, the fundamental uh, earth sciences, the, the hydrology, uh, the, the field of economics, operations research, stochastic hydrology, and really brought together a, a set of thinking about how to plan for and operate water resource systems. Uh, and, and all of that really revolves around the ideas of, of risk versus cost trade-offs. Uh, you can build the water supply reservoir larger and minimize your risk of shortage, but there's a cost associated with doing that. You can build your levees higher or do a flood zoning to a higher level of, of, of uh, high water, uh, but at a cost of, of, the, of the construction or the opportunity cost of that land versus what's the risk associated with that. And they sort of developed an objective framework for doing that. But all of that was predicated on the idea that, that the hydrologic variables of interest, particularly in this case stream flow, um, were a stationary process. Uh, that, that is to say, there is a mean value, there is a standard deviation, there is a serial correlation structure, etc. Uh, it may be known imperfectly, but nevertheless the underlying assumption was that it exists and we can plan on the basis of that and make rational decisions. And, and people of my generation, and Dr. Palmer and other people uh, who are my contemporaries, um, we really all kind of learned from that basic paradigm about how we go about uh, not only designing water resource systems, but also uh, optimally operating those water resource systems. Well, things have changed uh, since that time. This particular paper maybe um, highlighted the issue in a in a way that, that kind of got people talking about it. It wasn't the first time it was ever talked about. But the title of this is Stationarity is Dead, Wither Water Management. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to be a part of the team of people who wrote this little two-page policy forum piece in Science Magazine um, eight years ago. And it's been cited over 2,000 times. Um, and we make the point that, that we all recognize as scientists that the hydrologic world in which we live in is in a state of change. We talk here mostly about the climate driver of that change, but we also make mention, and I don't want to lose sight at all, of, of a number of other things that are important drivers of change. Things like the role that groundwater development and groundwater depletion play in terms of surface water flow, uh, the role of urbanization, the role of agriculture and other uh, irrigation and, and, and uh, artificial land drainage, which can have profound effects on the conditions of our rivers and the flows in those rivers. All of those things, including the climate issue, uh, we, from first principles, we know that these things have had and will continue to have an increasing impact on what is that probability distribution of flow? What does it mean? What is its standard deviation? What are its properties? Um, um, and what we argue here in this paper is, is uh, that we can no longer simply rely on this, the, the, the old paradigms that were built on stationarity, but at the same time, we said a suitable successor paradigm really has yet to be found. And a lot of that has to do with the fact of how much uncertainty there is about what the true nature of that change will be. Um, and, and when I talk about this, I know some people sometimes interpret my comments about this uncertainty as almost, <laughs> as, almost as if I'm a climate change denier. And I want to sort of state right off the, right off the bat, the, you know, the effect of greenhouse gases on the global atmosphere is undeniable. 
The effect of it on, on global temperature is undeniable, and its profound impacts in the Arctic uh, and high latitude areas, and the, and the resulting effects on sea level. The area of my own personal skepticism is whether or not we have even a modest understanding of what the nature of that global change in the atmosphere, how it will impact the water environment. And I speak, when I say water, I mean water on the continents, the rivers, the groundwater, the water quality, and all, all of those features. It's clear that it has an impact and it will continue to have a growing impact. But what is that impact? How well do we know it? And that's going to, so the, the tone of skepticism you may hear from me is not about greenhouse warming. It's a skepticism about what do we know about how these changes will, will transpire over the future. So a, a key phrase in this thing is really that, that, that a suitable successor paradigm for water resources planning and management uh, is really yet to be found. And I know that there's people in this room who are working on that, and I think it's being continually advanced, but it still remains, I think, a huge challenge. So, and this is the Potomac River that happens to be Key Bridge in Washington, D.C. Um, nobody's rowing because, in fact, I think that was about a 10 or 10 year recurrence interval flood that was going on. It was not exactly suitable conditions for rowing. My question is that so the challenge is how to build a bridge from the observed past to an uncertain future. Because there are people who have read our paper, Stationarity is Dead, and they say, aha, the past is irrelevant, and we don't. You know, we can't use all of that 100 plus years of historical hydrologic data to, to think about the future because the future is going to be different from the past. Um, I strongly disagree with that point of view, uh, that there's so much information that we can gain by looking at the historic record uh, to help us understand natural variability, persistence, uh, the, the nature of hydrologic extremes, etc. cetera, that that, that that past information is an enormous resource but it has to be tempered by our sense of how might those things be changing now and on into the future. Um, and, and I think that's the real challenge, is blending from what we know about the past into what we think might be coming in the future. Um, so it's a, to me, it's a call to that, that, that the scientific community involved in water resources needs to be looking at the question of trend and looking backwards in time to understand the trends that are going on around us um, as, a, as a way, as a complement and really in a balance between that backward looking empiricism and a forward looking um, uh, deterministic modeling or, or process based modeling. I'm going to emphasize the empiricism, but I want to make it clear that it, my, my plea is for a balance between the empiricism. And, and, the, and the modeling, uh, the physically based uh, uh, modeling, and I don't think there's enough going on in the empirical side. So why do we do, why should we do trend studies? And I have sort of three reasons that I'd like to lay out. And, and I'm going to be talking not only about things like river flow, but I'm also going to be talking about water quality, because both, both arenas, there's a tremendous amount of change going on around us that we need to understand. Um, one reason to do trend studies is to provide the basis for design and operations decisions, uh, something that Rick Palmer and I have both been involved in for 40, 39 years at least, I think, is, is something that is often called position analysis, where one, say, the operator of a water supply system finds themselves in a drought situation such as you have here right now and, and wants to say, um, gee, what is my, if we continue to use water at the rate we're using it, in this community, what is the risk that we're basically going to go dry uh, from our water supply system between now and the end of the calendar year or something like that? And we, we answer those kinds of questions by simulation of, of future possibilities over the, over the ensuing months. And we do that using historical record. We might drive it with atmospheric data. We might dr drive it with, uh, with river flow data. Uh, we draw, might use a statistical model of those phenomena in order to drive it. But we're looking for ways of coming up with probabilities and then looking at how we can affect those probabilities by management decisions, by rationing, by other <coughs> approaches to cutting back on water use. Uh, and there's a whole host of design and operations questions that absolutely depend 
on having a sort of an ensemble of historical information that we can run through the system and see how it behaves. Um, if all the data and information we have was from, you know, 80 years ago to 50 years ago, um, and we're looking at how we operate today, we can argue, you know, maybe that's not the best information to use because maybe there's some things that have changed in this system. So we want to use a, a, a set of information that is as up to date as we can possibly make it, and we need to understand how that system has changed over the period of record in order to make it a, a sort of a current reflection of the, of the probabilistic uh, nature of the phenomena rather than a, a, an outdated uh, perception of how it operates. So we need it for design and operations decisions at the current time. Um, we also need to do trend studies to help us evaluate deterministic trend models. And I'll give you two generic kinds of examples. In the area of water quality, um, I, I deal a lot with the Chesapeake Bay total maximum daily load, that's TMDL, um, uh, where they're trying to limit the nutrients flowing into Chesapeake Bay. Similar things apply in Long Island Sound and many estuaries and lakes uh, throughout the United States. Um, and, and doing those TMDLs, basically allocating the pollution loads among a bunch of sources, um, the deterministic models are absolutely necessary to say if the farmers do this on their landscape, if the sewage treatment plants operate in this manner, if we have this degree of urbanization, what will be the consequences in terms of the loading of, say, nitrogen or phosphorus into the, into the estuary of interest? We, we have to use those deterministic models as tools. But at the same time, we also have to say, do those deterministic models actually represent what's going on? And particularly, do they represent the trends that may be happening? So we need to look and say, what changes have the farmers made? What changes have the cities made over the recent years? And what do the data tell us about what's the quality of the water that's flowing into, into that estuary? And does that square with uh, what the model tells us, and I'll give you a, a specific example of that. In the area of flow and, and, the, and, the, in, uh, and climate change, uh, what I mean by this, this statement is the following. Generally speaking, in, in people doing planning exercises uh, that focused on climate change, there is a, uh, a general pattern of how people work, which is to use one or more uh, general circulation models, global climate models, um, and feed them basically a scenario of future increases in greenhouse gases and, and other uh, phenomena that aerosols, you name it, whatever. Um, run those things, hopefully run them multiple times because you get very different outcomes with each realization. Then downscale them using something like a regional climate model. Get some, some uh, time series, of simulated time series of precipitation and temperature, et cetera, and run those into some kind of a watershed model to, to eventually generate a record of stream flow or of groundwater levels and then ask some questions. How do some of the key variables change? What happens to floods? What happens to droughts? What happens to reliable water supply under those scenarios? And, and, and doing that is, is, a, is a very um, valuable and important input to our thinking about the future. But the question that I always have, and a question which I feel is, is really not been seriously addressed in the, in the climate and hydrology community, is do we think that that kind of modeling system has significant forecast skill in being able to describe the kinds of changes that we are likely to see in, in future years? And of course, we can't answer that directly because we don't know what that future is going to be. But there is a way of getting at that, recognizing the fact that greenhouse gas uh, uh, concentrations have already risen by a very substantial amount over the last roughly 50 years, uh, the, the period of rapid increase. And so the question is, we have records of what has happened to hydrology on the landscape uh, over that period of time, and we can describe it in a whole variety of ways what's happened to the mean, what's happened to the standard deviation, what's happened to the safe yield that you would get from that flow, and how do those actual realizations in history compare to what those modeling systems would tell us if they're used in hindcast mode. What I mean by hindcast mode is simply 
run the clock backwards and say, well, let's, gonna, let's start at the beginning of the 20th century with the actual greenhouse gas concentrations that existed at that time and, and run the simulations with an ever-increasing uh, level of greenhouse gases and other things like the volcanic eruptions and other things that affect the global climate and run out scenarios and ask ourselves what kind of changes do the general circulation models and regional climate models, et cetera, tell us about hydrology? And is there any general resemblance between the kinds of changes that we observe in, in the real world system as compared to what those models generated? Uh, my contention is, and I've done a little bit of this kind of testing, uh, is that there are some places where the changes that have actually occurred on the landscape are in fact vastly larger than anything that one would, would predict from the increase in greenhouse gases that have taken place to date. Uh, and, it, and that many of the changes are essentially inexplicable in terms of, of what the global climate models are doing. So, you know, in, in other realms of, of water science and hydrology, we always want to verify our models. We, we say, let's, let's build a groundwater model to understand the recharge of a particular aquifer or the water quality in, a, in an aquifer. Um, and we can we look at use, using that model and see whether we can verify that it even approximately uh, reproduces the history that we have in fact seen. Um, I should also say that in this kind of hindcast mode uh, verification, uh, we're not looking for perfection and we're not looking for you know, when did, did it get the droughts right? Did it get the, the, the wet periods right? It's more about did it get the variability and the long-term overall tendencies because the, the, there's a tremendous variability in the outputs that you get from a, a given climate model uh, under multiple simulations. It's, it's about did it get the kind, roughly the kinds of patterns that we actually observe. The third reason to do trend studies is to help evaluate progress and identify emerging issues. When I say evaluating progress, thinking in terms of water quality, um, efforts are being made, big investments are being made to improve water quality in many water bodies. Um, and and to, all too often, and you see this in the media, you, you see agencies that are responsible for that saying, you know, we've had a 50% you know, a, a improvement in our nutrient levels and so forth. And when you start to dig in and probe, what they're really telling you is, Based on our models and based on what people tell us they are doing on the landscape, we should have a 50% improvement. What I want to know is what's the improvement, if any, that you're actually having, not just what the model says. So we need to evaluate progress in order to make the deep course directions to do the right thing. And also identify emerging issues because there are some times where, there are, where we're kind of blindsided by issues that, that really nobody in the science community was predicting. But if we make the measurements and then do the analysis, we may discover some fairly widespread, um, serious kinds of, of issues. And I'll just you know, give you a preview of one of those issues, which is um, um, dissolved phosphorus coming from agricultural lands um, is a growing problem in many agricultural parts of the United States. And phosphorus was always considered to be a problem associated with soil erosion and the attack phosphorus on those sediment particles. And while that's indeed true, what we're finding now is the excessive amounts of phosphorus on the landscape is moving in the dissolved form. And all the efforts in the world to control sediment uh, erosion and, and sediment movement uh, are really of no benefit in terms of this because we basically saturated our soils with phosphorus. And, and basically, as far as I'm concerned, almost no one was predicting that we would see this but now the data are bearing it out and we're beginning to make adjustments in the way we think about that. So um, this is, I'm going to give you a quote that's a favorite of mine that really gets into this whole area of data analysis that I think is so important. And I'm just going to give you the first half of the quote before the second half. The statement was data without models are chaos. That is to say when we look at raw environmental data, whether it's chemistry data or flow data or what have you, um, it, it's very noisy, it's very hard to understand what the patterns are, um, and the reason it's so hard to understand and when you just look at it is there are so many things going on. There are normal climatic fluctuations between wet periods and dry periods. There are seasonal factors, uh, extreme events, etc., that, that um, 
create a very messy sort of a pattern and the only